So the American Enterprise Institute published a document at the end of March looking at the roadmap to recovery. And they published a coronavirus document that basically goes through the different steps that will be needed in order to basically get America back to where it was and how the process of going from pandemic America into post-pandemic recovery America will look. So it's basically an exit strategy for the US. So we'll just have a little look through the document. And I think it's interesting because although it is America specific, a lot of the protocol is quite transferable or quite generalizable. So I wouldn't be surprised if we did see some of this in other countries in terms of their own recovery plans. So phase one focuses on slowing the spread. And phase one really works with where we are currently. And the big point of phase one is to essentially flatten the curve Curve, and flattening the curve is something that we're all trying to do across the globe because there's no healthcare system in the world sophisticated enough to safely manage all patients who would be infected by this disease if they were all infected at the same time. So if we can stagger the amount of people who need healthcare treatment, then that can save lives ultimately. So phase one is all about the things that we already know and they pick out lots of these different factors that can help to slow the curve and they finish up the this first section talking about some of the threshold measurements that we would need to meet in order to move into the next phase and how we can go about achieving those threshold measurements. Focus quite heavily on physical distancing so that's keeping up with our social isolation measures, making sure that we're really focused on ensuring that distance between people and keeping things closed. So at this point they are talking a lot about keeping community gatherings to a minimum, spaces such as schools and shopping centres and areas are closed, no congregating spaces, promoting teleworking for non-essential employees, urging the public to limit unnecessary domestic or international travel, cancelling and postponing meetings and gatherings, shutting down areas, encouraging restaurants to provide takeout delivery services if possible rather than indoors, and issuing stay-at-home advisories in hotspots where transmission is particularly intense. So this is if we saw like a huge spike in cases because epidemiologically what we look for is cases and then clusters based on cases and then we look for a bigger spread based on clusters so it's almost like it escalates up so epidemiologically you can look for little trigger marks or like little warning signs so if there are any hotspot areas where you're seeing these cases doubling quite quickly or spikes in the incidents then you can say right okay this particular geographic region we need to do some additional work and this is why testing is so important. This is another reason why it's so important to test and test and test because you're able to identify these hotspot areas and then put some of those parameters in place in order to maintain those spikes. So the other things within this first section looks at um, ensuring functioning of the healthcare system. So like we've already said, just making sure that it all keeps going. We don't want any overburdening as, or at least as little as possible um, because obviously if you've got that hugely large number of people who need healthcare all at the same time, people who would ordinarily have had a good chance of survival end up not having such a good chance and potentially having fatal outcomes. So we want to ensure that that happens as, least, as little as possible. So keep that low and keep the healthcare service functioning at as um, optimal level as possible. Increasing supply of PPE goes without saying. People need to have protective equipment because it's our healthcare staff who are most at risk. They are the front line. And in all scenarios, it's always carers and healthcare workers that get illnesses first, whether it's a new emerging disease like Nipah in um in Southeast Asia or Ebola in Africa or coronavirus worldwide, it's always the healthcare workers who are most at risk. So PPE is essential for them. Uh, implementing comprehensive surveillance systems. Now, this is something as, an, as, as like a public health person, for me, this is absolutely essential. Good surveillance is the key to everything we need to do. If we don't have good surveillance, we can't do as good a job. Like I just said about the clusters, so cluster, cluster, case, um, or sorry, case, case, cluster. Um, if we don't know where those cases are, then we can't tackle them. Massively scaling contact tracing, isolation and quarantine, absolutely. Again, goes without saying, this is one of the things that places like South Korea have done quite well. Um, Singapore has done quite well with this. Um, Germany's done quite well. There's not, you know, no, no country is perfect, uh, but there's not a lot you can do if you don't know where your cases are. And it's really important to know and have that surveillance because 
any of those contacts are potentially at risk and any of those contacts could go on spreading exponentially but also affecting really um, weaker immune systems or people who have uh, a, a higher risk of a more complicated case of this. So it's really important that we try to maintain the safety of those with weaker immune systems and those who are more high at risk. Offer voluntary local isolation and quarantine. Comfortable free facilities should be provided for cases and contacts who prefer isolation and quarantine away from home. For example, if there's a large household, some may want to recover in a hotel room that's been repurposed rather than risking family members. And I think this is really key. And we saw this actually in the UK. Lots and lots of NHS workers were really frightened to go home to their families because there was no testing. Still, at this to this point where I'm making this video, the testing for frontline staff is very, very limited. Um, there's care homes here in the UK that are rationing five tests a day. So here, here in the UK, there was uh, a celebrity who gave the use of his hotel to frontline staff so that they didn't have to make that decision of you know going to work and then going home to potentially infecting their families which I thought was such a heartwarming story to read so I was really happy to hear that so I think that the fact that you know that that element that sociology the side of, of that that um the part that affects people the most is taken account of within the strategy is, is quite positive um and then the threshold movements for moving into phase two focus on whether or not you have a sustained reduction of cases for at least 14 days um, hospitals in the state are safely able to treat the patients without requiring hospitalisation, without reporting to crisis standards. Um, and the state is able to conduct active monitoring of confirmed cases and their contacts, which obviously those are essential criteria to meet before we can progress any further. The last thing to point out in this, which is actually really interesting, is the fact that they encourage everybody to wear a mask. So the last section of phase one is encourage everyone in the public to wear a mask. And this is often in stark contrast to what we've been hearing across the globe. Lots of governments are saying no masks, don't wear a mask, no masks are necessary. Um, and what they're saying in this, this um, document is that actually it's not about whether or not you're sick or ill. It's the fact that there is this high percentage of asymptomatic spreaders. So you could have it and not even know you have it. But if everybody wears a mask, then you're going to prevent asymptomatic spread or at least maybe not prevent, but certainly reduce the impact of asymptomatic spread, but also reduce that risk of aerosolization and leaving potential um like virus particles within the atmosphere or on surfaces. So basically by wearing a mask, we're cutting down on the risk. We're not eliminating it, but it's certainly cutting down on the risk, which will help to slow the transmission and flatten the curve, which is essentially what we are trying to do in this section. So phase two actually talks about how to reopen state by state. So this document is suggesting that you lift physical distancing distancing measures when you meet the threshold from phase one and this should be done state by state with sufficient time between each state to monitor and adjust for any resurgence of transmission so it's basically a okay let's lift the restrictions on this state see what happens what do we see in terms of incidents are we seeing more new cases popping up what's happening in terms of the sickness the impact on healthcare services the critical nature of the illness um, so it's a case of monitoring and if that looks good move on to the next day and if that looks good move on and move on and move on so it's a staggered approach to lifting restrictions so the document also looks at case-based interventions using public health capacity developed in phase one every confirmed case should be either isolated at home or in a hospital voluntarily and CDC should provide good guidance. Physical distancing measures can be relaxed. You can accelerate the development of therapeutics and special care for vulnerable populations. Identifying those who are immune. So this is a really important aspect and something I'm going to pick up on in a later video. But serology is a really important aspect of identifying who's already been infected. And this has a lot of benefits, both economically, epidemiologically, and for surveillance, public health surveillance, because it basically tells you who's had the disease. So obviously, if you know you've had it, you're probably okay to go back to work. And obviously, there is still always the, the outlying chance 
means that reinfection can occur, but generally we can hopefully assume that once you're infected, you do have sufficient antibodies to keep a second infection at bay. So if you can do an antibody test to see if you have actually had the illness already, if you've already had COVID-19, then that will theoretically allow you to reintegrate into the population and be able to go back into the workforce. And it's gonna be particularly important for at-risk people and healthcare workers. And for surveillance purposes, it gives us a lot of epidemiological data to work with so we can learn more about the disease and we can know how far it's spread because even today, like uh, a couple of days ago, I obviously did the analysis of that paper from UCL and they looked at the fact that they believe that 11 European countries actually have anywhere between a 1.88% and an 11% um, rate of infection anyway. So they're suggesting that that number of people across 11 countries has already been infected. So they actually said that on average, they think about 2.7% of the UK population has already had coronavirus. So it's interesting and I think um, a serological approach to this will definitely give us more insight and I think it will be really really valuable for public health purposes and also for practical purposes like managing things and getting people back out into um, working and opening up uh, restrictions on states and places and generally you know managing this from a population level. What they're really hoping for before we can move into phase three is that we've got something that is is additional to non-pharmaceutical interventions like restrictive work um, so lockdowns they're hoping that there will be some kind of vaccination or treatment so some therapeutic interventions which obviously at this point there is not Moving into phase three, this is to establish protection and then just lift all restrictions, which means we can essentially get back to normal. So the goals of this is to prevent infection, treat those with the early disease, prevent bad, to prevent bad outcomes, provide prophylaxis for those who are infected and prevent them from developing disease or to reduce the severity. In the case of a vaccine, build up population immunity through the vaccine um, to the virus in order to reduce illness and death or to greatly slow the spread and then to eventually enable the lifting of all the physical distancing measures. So these threshold actions are actually really important and they're basically looking at building up herd immunity through vaccination. So essentially, the more people who are immune to COVID-19, the the, the more the transmission will be broken because if COVID-19 hits a person who has either already had it or has been vaccinated, that breaks the chain of transmission and that person will no longer be infected or able to go on and infect other people. Able to manage the disease in a controlled way and we need to be able to stop the spread of this and hopefully the population will no longer be naive and by naive I just mean that um, we have experience of it within the population in terms of antibodies. So it's something that we've been exposed to. So at least a proportion of the population will be already immune either through vaccination or through having had it, which will slow the spread, reduce the transmission and break a lot of those transmission chains. So that is a big part of phase three. And ultimately phase three takes us into that um, new and kind of new world almost phase four and what they're suggesting is rebuilding so phase four is all about rebuilding in terms of pandemic preparedness and ensuring that basically America and hopefully the rest of the world is ready for a potential pandemic if this ever happens again now I can't imagine you know it's it's, it's hard to think being in the, the height of a pandemic currently that we could ever go through something like this again um, but it's always possible isn't it so having had this experience what they're suggesting in this paper is that phase four is about really ramping up the preparedness for uh, pandemics and infectious diseases and what they actually say, which I have to say I found really interesting and really, really um, exciting, is that they want to create this new department that is basically forecasting for infectious diseases. So, you know, like the weather service and how they do things like tornado warnings um, and adverse weather condition warnings. Well, they want to do that, but for infectious diseases. And as soon as I read that, I was like, my hand's in the air. I'll work there. <laughs> Give me a job there. I want to work there. Um, but yeah, I thought that was really, really interesting. I thought that is something really positive and I think it's something that 
is very necessary. They want to work on developing vaccines in months rather than years. Um, obviously, vaccine development is a very difficult and complex process. And I will do a video separately on vaccines and how vaccines are created and that kind of thing. I did do some work with the Wellcome Trust around this um, a couple of years ago. So I'll dig out some of that information and share that. Um, modernize and fortify healthcare systems. Well, yeah, absolutely. We really need to get that done. Um, and then governance. We need to move away from decentralization and get this more federal. So obviously, I'm not American, but from what I do know about the American healthcare system is that obviously we have this federal um, governing system and also a devolution to local state levels in terms of health monitoring, managing with governors and mayors. And I think a lot of that it, within this pandemic has just been sort of left to state level to make decisions and, you know, things like testing, testing capacity, buying tests, um, dealing with healthcare pro uh, problems capacity issues you know there doesn't seem to be as much kind of centralization as an issue like this really does need um so they're saying in this document that basically control needs to get back at central government in order to make sure something like this if this ever happens again it can just be rolled out quickly everyone ppe everyone here's what we need um this is the testing this is what you need to do this is the protocol here's what you need to get it done um so making it more efficient and making it basically faster, smoother, more efficient and hoping to save lives. And yeah, so that, that's pretty much that document. I think that definitely coming out of this is going to be a lot of lessons learned, but I think there'll be a lot of positive things going forward as well, which you can only kind of build on what we know, build on our experiences and hopefully create a much more modern response system. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting and useful. Thank you so much for watching if you caught this and I will see you in the next one for another update.